morning. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you all so much for joining us. We are thrilled to be sharing yet another program as part of our 2020 election series. And we couldn't have done this without the support of our sponsors and our community partners. Specifically, I would like to highlight our sponsors, Andrew Tavacoli and Dan Schnur, who are both board members. Also Dick Mater, an International Circle member, and Joel Mogi, a diplomat level member. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your ongoing support of our organization and mission. And we hope everyone will enjoy this series of programming. For those of you who would like to submit a question, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions and Jessica will be managing them as usual in about 20 or 25 minutes. Please submit your questions to both Dan and Lynn for this vigorous conversation. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's program, how the media will influence the election from broadcast to cable to digital organizing with Dr. Lynn Vavrek, Professor of American Politics and Public Policy at UCLA and Politics Professor Dan Schnur. I'd also like to acknowledge UCLA as a member of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. So Dan and Lynn, it's time to turn this interesting conversation over to you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much, Kim. And Lynn, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, I know how busy you are even under normal circumstances, but seven days before a presidential election, I'm sure your schedule must be absolutely crazy. So we're, we're grateful to have you here with us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay. For those of you who aren't familiar um, with Professor Lynn Vavrek's work, let me take a minute to recommend two tremendous books that she's co-authored and that I've used with my classes. Um, over the years. Um, in 2012, she and her co-author John Sides wrote a tremendous book on that year's presidential campaign between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney called The Gamble, and then followed up four years ago with an even better book, I can rank them, on the 2016 campaign called Identity Crisis. I just asked Lynn if she could have her book on the 2020 election done in time for my, for my first week of classes in mid-January, and she let me down very easily but I'm already awaiting it for, for future semesters. So Lynn, I'm eager to give uh, our audience today just a taste of what my students get every semester. What I wanna do before we dig into a conversation more specifically about the media, because of course that's today's topic, I'd like to start off with a, a, a broader uh, question and set of observations from you. Because one common thread that's run through much of your work over the years is the idea that a lot of the things that we watch, those of us who pay particularly close attention to politics, the stuff we watch on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis, isn't nearly as impactful as we think it is. And for our audience, who are extremely intelligent and very well-informed and, like me, absolutely glued to the news every nanosecond, <laughs> I'm wondering if you can give us some guidance on why that might not be the best way to understand what's really happening on the political landscape. Sure, um, and let me just say too that I remember all of the times that you've come to class at UCLA and and shared stories about messaging with the students too. And so it's a it's we're mutually benefiting from each other's work here. So thank you for doing that as well. Yeah. Um, so I when I think about presidential campaigns. I think that it is important to think about four things. Um, and the first couple are these enduring structural features of every presidential campaign. And that would include um, the very strong and stable role of party identification in people's choices, the role of the nation's economy in sort of setting the stage for the play that will ultimately become the campaign, that's the stage dressing, it's very important. And then in that context, on that stage, the messages, who the candidates are and the messages that they choose to deliver. And there's even some structure to that year by year that we can talk about that makes it very regular. But then the last thing is this thing you're talking about, the day-to-day -day paying attention to 
you know, whether, I don't know if you guys saw the story about the Santa Clauses were going to be essential workers and get the first vaccines. This was a, a Trump administration proposal. You know, that the kind of day-to-day -day, um, news, the newsiness of the campaign. And as you say, um, that is changing every day. So it's dynamic and something to pay attention to, unlike these other things, which are quite stable. But really, we're talking about swinging just a chunk of the electorate, which is not very big. So while that day to day is interesting and exciting, um, it is persuasion is hard. And we're talking about persuading just a small set of people. Now, if the election is close, that small set of people could be pivotal. So it could be critical this day to day. But for the most part, most people are being affected by the stable factors. And of course, one of the challenges, and this can segue very nicely into a conversation about news media, one of the challenges for news media is that they look for something that is new to cover. You very rarely see a headline or a story on the evening news that says, the world is exactly the same today as it was yesterday. So they That's look right. for these new angles and these in, in these day-to-day -day sort of disruptors. But for those of us who consume the news, that might not be the best way for us to to look at the landscape. How would how, how would you like? And I know you you, know, you you do it very politely, but how would you respectfully advise the decision makers in the news media to rethink the way they present us information about the campaign, particularly in the in the closing weeks? It's it's very hard, and you know I think it's important to remember that the news is a business. It is not a public service. Um, there are some public service oriented outlets, and you know what those are. Um, I always tell my students, it's easy to sit back and say, oh, I wish there would be less sensational headlines. I wish there would be, you know, less novel, less focus on the novel, uh, more policy coverage. That's something I hear all the time, more policy coverage. Um, and I always say to my students, you know, well, there are programs on PBS that will dig in deeply to the policy. Um, have you ever watched those? Mm, no. And there's a reason for that. So the news being a business and the incentives that that brings really do produce the product that we're getting. And yeah, maybe policy coverage does take a bit of a backseat. Um, the, the things that are the same day to day take a bit of a backseat. Foreign policy is something that rarely shows up in presidential campaign news coverage unless there is a dynamic situation or a dramatic change. Um, nonetheless, it's very important to knowing what kind of world we're gonna live in under candidate A or candidate B. And so those kinds of casualties, I think um, it would be good to try to think of ways to change a bit of the coverage, but I don't think the solutions are obvious or easy. Well, and, and I think you make a great point. The information is there for people who want it. I always tell my students, I said, if only there was, it was an instantaneous form of technological communication that allowed us to access every candidate's position on every issue at any time. Oh, wait, there is. And to, in, in, and to your same point, it's not fair to pick on our students because most uh, older people don't necessarily take advantage of that opportunity either. So I think your point is well placed. But let's go back to the point that you were making a moment ago about sort of those broadest uh, structural factors. Can you talk a little bit in the context of the 2020 campaign? What are those structural factors? How have they shaped the landscape in a way that the day-to-day -day back and forth may not change? So 2020 is very interesting on this because it is almost like we started the campaign under one reality or to push the analogy on one stage. And then in March, all of a sudden, we moved to a different theater, a different stage, and we were putting on a different play. So 2020, it, most presidential elections are not like that. Um, you know, even as the Vietnam War is changing, you know, it, there's just not that fundamental shift uh, in the middle of a presidential campaign, there are usually more, if something's changing, it's changing over the, a long um, arc. So 
the way that these structural factors are affecting 2020 um, is interesting because from January to March, if you remember when the Democratic nominating contests were happening, um, you know, Donald Trump in about late January or early February said, okay, I want to kick off my campaign too. So he said, I'm, I'm going to do it. And so he headed down to Florida, I think it was in Florida, and uh, he, he kicked off his campaign by saying to people, now you don't like me very much, I know this, but I also know you're going to vote for me because I brought you this booming economy. And he seemed to really understand that his best play for getting reelected was to remind people that they are better off than they were four years ago and that he was responsible for that. A sort of Janet Jackson approach, what have you done for me lately? But then in the middle of March when COVID hit and the economy, uh, the bottom fell out of the economy, he can no longer pursue that strategy. And so at that point, his argument has to change. And there's always a candidate in every presidential election who does not benefit from the state of the nation's economy. Only one candidate can either claim credit for the growing economy or place blame for the sinking economy. So he then, Trump then, in 2020 in March, becomes this other candidate whose job is to refocus the election off of the economy and onto some other issue. But not just any issue, it has to be an issue on which you think you're closer to most voters than your opponent, and your opponent is stuck in an unpopular position. And it has to be something that can be made to be more important than the economy. Now, in 2020, that's a tall order. In most years, that's a tall order. These candidates who are disadvantaged by the economy rarely win. So this is hard to do. Candidates do it, but it takes a very special kind of candidate. Donald Trump did it in 2016. And the question is, can he do it in 2020, this time as a sitting incumbent who is responsible for the declining economy? And it's a big ask. Well, it, it is a big ask. And as we've talked about on these, pre by the way, let the record show that last week, uh, this for our audience, let the record show that last week, Ron Brownstein talked about public enemy. This week, Professor Lynn Vavrek is talking about Jan Janet Jackson. Let it never be said <laughs> not offering a good pop culture goes along with our politics each week. But it is a tremendous uh, challenge. Lynn, you're, you're exactly right. And in fact, as you know, and I think must, must, much of our audience knows, in the last century, there have only been four incumbent presidents who've lost their reelection campaign. Um, going backwards, you know, George H.W. Bush, Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, and Herbert Hoover. And the one thing they had in common is all of them ran for re-election at a time when the economic circumstances were not favoring them. So given the broader view that you, pref that you correctly prefer to take, Lynn, why isn't this a done deal? Um, in other words, if the economy is poor and the candidate who generally suffers from a poor economy is the incumbent, why is this election, at least in, in the minds of many, still still uncertain? Yeah, it, it's even a more robust pattern than you described. You can think of just not just even the actual incumbent person, but the incumbent party candidate. So John McCain, who you're familiar with, in 2008, running on the incumbent party ticket, but paying the price for the global financial crisis. So it, it is even a more robust pattern than you describe, but it is not 100% determinative. And there are cases where candidates who are disadvantaged by the economy, um, John Kennedy in 1960, Jimmy Carter in 1976, um, they, if you wanna think about it this way, they steal those elections away from the candidate who should have had that economic advantage, um, Donald Trump in 2016. So in all of these cases, the economy is growing, but it's growing very slowly. So you might argue that the economy is mixed in these periods, but it is slowly growing. And these candidates do manage to win these elections very, very narrowly. And the reason that I think that that can happen is they identify, I think um, the 1960 election in John Kennedy is a great example of this. 
Um, the 2016 Trump campaign is as well, but let's just think about Kennedy for a second. Um, runs basically the same messaging campaign that Adlai Stevenson ran in 52 and 56. We're in an all out war for the future of the world with the Soviets, whose system of government is going to win. But Kennedy could not have been more different in delivering that message than Stevenson in both of those prior years. He made it about this thing he called the new frontier. You know, we stand today on the edge of the 1960s. It's a new frontier. What are we going to do? We're going to explore the oceans and the skies. We're going to dominate the Soviets. And he, he made this into an epic battle for everything um, with the Soviets. Whereas Stevenson took a much more intellectual approach to communism and the differences with democracy and capitalism and, and didn't engage people's imagination. So you, you have to find a way to connect this idea that you're trying to make more important than the economy to everyone's life and to say that your opponent can't get the job done. And Kennedy running against Nixon painted Nixon as part of the problem and everyone will remember the missile gap. He was there when the missile gap was, was put into place and he did nothing about it. Okay, so, and there were there are lots of things we could talk about with the missile gap, but in 2016, Trump is adopting that same kind of um, idea. He is refracting everything through a lens of identity and saying, it's not about you losing your job. It's about you losing your jobs to people who have come here and cut in front of you in line. And he's making everything about identity. And Clinton is stuck in the position. She's, she's not going to argue that same position. And so that is something that is important to many Americans. And he taps into that in a way. And he didn't create those attitudes. They were there all along. Mitt Romney knew about those attitudes. John McCain knew about those attitudes. And, and you can tell us, Dan, about the decisions um, that those candidates made in not adopting that messaging strategy and, and those positions. But Trump decides to go do it. And there's leverage there. Everybody knew that. Um, he's just willing to go do it. And he's now in 2020 faced with the same challenge. He has to refocus the election off of the economy onto something else. And again, he is going for an identity refracted approach, but this time it's about crime, law and order and the safety of suburbia. He says to suburban women, I saved your neighborhoods from what? From the unruly mob. Who are the unruly mob? Not people like you, right? I saved your neighborhood from this policy. He literally says that was going to allow low income housing, housing into your neighborhoods. Who lives in low-income housing? Not people like you. So he's doing this again. Um, and it, it worked for him very narrowly, obviously, in 2016. You asked the question, sorry, a long answer to why isn't this a done deal? Um, and the answer is that be, because he recognizes that um, if you think about the electorate as a pie, and we can, we can cut that pie along this economic dimension, everyone prefers growth to decline. Very easy. So if that's the dimension on which we're cutting the, the, the pie, um, the Biden campaign is advantaged. Trump wants to cut the pie in a totally different dimension. And he wants it to be about these issues um, about identity. And there are a lot of people on his side of that issue. Um, maybe not a majority, but he's hoping that he can grow and expand that, that dimension. Oh boy, several, several many, many fascinating points in there, which I'd love to follow up on, but two in particular really struck me, and I hope the audience picked up on them also. Uh, what we heard Professor Lynn Vavrick saying in particular about the economy is what we obviously know to start with, which you know, the economy, good or bad, is gonna help one candidate and hurt the other. And we've all spent a lot of time thinking about how a poor economy hurts an incumbent like Trump this year, but, as Lynn correctly points out, four years ago, a strong economy should have worked to the detriment of a challenger running from the odd party, and he found a way to overcome that. And second, whether it's Kennedy and a generational message, or Carter after Watergate on a message of morality, and now oh, Trump on a message of identity, 
economy tends to be predetermining unless a candidate can find a message that eclipses it. Very, very interesting. So Lynn, I'm, I'm going to open it up to our, our really smart audience and they're much smarter questions than mine in just a minute. But we did advertise this as a conversation about media and we yes. covered a lot of uh, topics, including that. But before we open it up, you talked a little bit about the role of news media in the campaign. Can we talk a little bit about paid media and advertising? It's less of a big deal here in California. Here we watch commercial after commercial about ballot initiatives rather than candidates. But you know, my dad and stepmom live in uh, Verona, Wisconsin. And my dad says he cannot watch a Green Bay Packer game live without seeing at least 40 or 50 <laughs> television commercials. The campaigns are pouring immense amount of money into these ads. What's their impact? Great question. Um, so, just to keep going on this foreign policy theme, the ad race is a lot like an arms race. So candidates are trying to keep that advertising inventory in balance. If my opponent goes up by 10 ads, I want to go up by 10 ads or 11. When I go up by 11, they have to add one. So you want to be winning the balance of advertising. And that's why you see the escalation, just like in the arms race. This equilibrium, we're trying to keep it no matter how um, much of an increase there is in the volume of advertising. Why do candidates continue to increase the volume? Because the effects of ads are small. They're not zero, but they are small and they are fleeting. They go away very quickly. And, and this is true in all kinds of advertising. You know, why does McDonald's continue to advertise? Everybody knows McDonald's very familiar brand, very familiar set of products, right? If they stop advertising, they lose market share. They know that. So they continue to advertise. And it's the same thing in politics. The effects are small, they go away fast. And that means that you have to constantly be doing it. And if I'm constantly doing it, that means you have to be constantly doing it. So there are effects um, and they, they don't seem to diminish it. You know, it's there are effects in the beginning of the campaign and there are effects in the end of the campaign. The effects in the beginning, they go away fast. So they're not necessarily affecting the, the election day result, but they might be affecting poll results that are proximal to those ads or fundraising that, are, that you know, is happening at the same time. Um, but advertising at the end right now, especially the last five days, these are the ads that are really going to affect election day results in a small way, but they will. So it's funny, one of the first things that I learned way, way back in my own campaign days is that once you go on the air with ads, you never go off. In other words, you figure out how much money you can afford advertising, and then you count backwards from election day or even the beginning of mail voting, because toward Lynn's point, the effect is so fleeting. That if I run an ad, a week's worth of ads and then go off for a week, I've wasted the money because the impact is, has disappeared. The, imp the impression I get from your analogy of the arms race, though, Lynn, is that the two sides cancel each other out. Given the tremendous financial imbalance that we're seeing in this campaign between the Biden uh, organization and the Trump campaign, is that still the case? Or does Biden's financial edge give him some advantage in that regard? Well, it definitely gives him some advantage because he is out advertising the president um, almost everywhere and will continue to do so in the next several days. It, number one rule, do not see the end game to your opponent. Um, that that is, comes through in all of the analyses of elections. I, I should add just one thing that the, I'm talking about effects in presidential elections. For down ballot elections, the ads have slightly bigger effects, but still, you know, not three points, not definitely not 10 points, not three points. Um, you know, maybe close to one point for a massive ad advantage. Um, but they are bigger in down ballot than in presidential races. But but this the current situation with this presidential race um, is not great for the president. Two things, the, the imbalance in the ad advertising going into election day, but also uh, the increasing number of COVID cases and COVID deaths as we get to election day is also not good for him. Last question, I promise, and then we really will bring in the smarter questions from our, our audience. 
But you talked about how the last week or so is particularly important because uh, it's more likely to be information that voters retain all the way till election day. Let's move from traditional TV advertising for a moment, if we can, Lynn, to digital ads. Does the fact mm -hmm. that Facebook has announced that it will not run, put up new ads in the closing days of a campaign, what's the impact on that? Does that mean that the social media ads that we've seen up until now are less, uh, are less impactful? There's a difference between those kinds of um, social media advertising and broadcast television advertising, which really is its own kind of medium. Um, the mass in mass advertising is really important there. You're hitting people who you on, basically on accident as a byproduct of them watching the Packers game or watching their favorite television show, they get a bit of information about your candidate by accident. That's very important. When you think about what's happening on social media, those ads are highly targeted um, and they are often used to raise money, to help organize because they're being sent to people who are predisposed to already support the candidate. So persuasion is hard. I think I said that in the beginning. And if you are going to use your social media advertising to try to persuade people. Dan, you told me something years ago that I have never forgotten. And I, I say over and over again, every campaign comes down to the people who are always going to vote for you, the saints, the people who are never going to vote for you, the sinners, and the people in the middle who are the salvageable vote. You can save them. And so if you're using your social media to try to address the people who you can save, right, the, the swing voters, the persuadable voters, you have to believe that you are very good at figuring out who those people are, where they go on the internet, and how to micro-target them. And most of the evidence, most of the work that has been done on this in the social sciences suggests that candidates are not at good, as good at this as they think they are, and that when they get it wrong, there are backlash effects. And so the costs of doing this are potentially high in the other direction. So I think that the, the focus on what's been going on on, on social media um, is a little bit misplaced. I, we, we do want to care about that for lots of objective reasons about truth. Um, but in terms of persuasion, those mass television advertise, advertisements, I think, are doing a lot more of the, of the heavy lift. Great. Uh, I think that's a really, really important distinction. Traditional broadcast media is a great way of persuading those salvageables or those swing voters Online media, digital media is most effective when it comes to motivating your most loyal supporters. So really important distinction. Jessica, I apologize for keeping you waiting so long, but if you'd be willing to join us, I think I'm eager and I know Lynn is even more eager to hear questions from our, <laughs> our audience. Thank you so much. We're getting a lot of questions and uh, I'm sure that we'll have many left over at the end, but we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so starting off, is it even conceivable to reinstate the fairness doctrine so that news is a not, not a for-profit business? Um, there are lots, you can think of lots of institutional reforms that might help bring balance back, which is I think what um, we're really talking about when we think about the fairness doctrine. Um, and I don't think it's impossible, um, but I think that things like, you know, the, the, the seal in the upper right-hand corner of a news story that you see online, um, you know, maybe that it's been vetted by a group of independent uh, evaluators or ways to signal to people that this is a legacy media outlet. Um, it's not just a content provider for, you know, a certain type of group of people or an organization or how it's funded or whatnot. So you can think of institutions that might help with that. Um, I just think that the space for, for information now and the blending of information as entertainment makes it very difficult to ever think that we can return to this idea that um, there are three places you go to get news. Um, now, having said that, more people watch network news than watch cable news. So, you know, it, it isn't really um, 
like nobody's watching ABC, CBS, and NBC news. And if you do watch those nightly news broadcasts, they will they will look very different to you from uh, what's happening on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. And and many many people watch those programs and watch the morning shows um, and the Sunday shows. Um, so. So I guess my answer is a little combination of yes and no. We can think creatively about how to signal people about news, but we're probably not going back. And and just to add to that, if I can, Jessica, I, I, th I think Lynn's point is is exactly right. The fairness doctrine was developed in a pre-cable, pre-internet, pre-digital media era when there was a triopoly on the ways in which the average voter could access information. One of my favorite examples is that in the 1976 presidential campaign, um, Gerald Ford's University of Michigan football games, reruns uh, re could not be shown because that gave him an unfair advantage. And four years later, of course, Ronald Reagan's movies could not be shown. Many of Reagan's advisors believe that actually benefited his campaign rather than hurt it not to have it on the air. But either way, if you do assume a universe with thousands, if not millions of platforms, I don't know that there would be anything detrimental about reinstituting the fairness doctrine. I just don't know it would have nearly the type of impact that the questioner understandably would like it to. Thank you. Um, and this is kind of a good follow up to that uh, sense of a million different platforms. So what are your thoughts on some of the independent journalists and creators that are getting huge viewership on YouTube, thus avoiding the news gatekeepers on the major networks like the Young Turks, Dave Rubin, and Tim Pool. How influential are they for millennials and younger viewers who are less likely to watch terrestrial news? Those kinds of outlets, and I would, I would, you know, let's broaden the question a little bit. Um, even for people who aren't millennials, who may not be that interested in, there are lots of people who are not that interested in politics, uh, no matter how old they are. Um, and one thing that has that we've known for a long time is um, something that we used to call soft news. That the hard news, soft news distinction has really fallen away, and that's a whole different and interesting conversation. But soft news um, happened on places like the Oprah Winfrey Show or Saturday Night Live, programs that weren't news programs, but that delivered a lot of content about um, what was happening right now in the world. And one thing that we know is for a set of voters, those kinds of soft news programs were very important in helping them make sense of the choices in front of them. And so I'm sure these kinds of programs that attract younger audiences that do it in the medium that they're more comfortable in, um, while not hard news, which was defined as programs that had trained reporters going out to cover stories and then reporting on stories. Um, so if you weren't doing that, you were doing soft news. Then, and th those kinds of programs can be very important for certain sets of people. Now, the challenge is that those people are less engaged in politics and they are less likely to turn out on election day. So you have to move them from that category of being a sometimes paying attention to politics person into someone who's gonna make time on election day to go vote or put their ballot in the mail or go early, make a plan. Um, and that's a big, that's a big challenge. Thank you. Um, our, uh, sorry, are political action committees in this election operating in the same way they did in 2016? Well, I think I would say as they did in 2012. Um, 2016, there really, um, there was much less of that than there was in 2012. As the candidates continue to raise more and more money, uh, they're doing more and more of their own advertising. So um, I think that the the role of PACs and super PACs and dark money PACs um, really has become much less of a feature of presidential elections in the last two cycles relative to where it was after 2010 and where people thought it was going. Um, and the other thing I will say is 
Um, I talk to a lot of people like Dan who have worked in politics and helped candidates craft messages. And they all tell me like, my ad can be better because I know the candidate. I spend time with him or her. I know essentially what makes them special. Whereas a PAC can't coordinate with the candidate. And, that, and therefore their ad is less effective. Um, and I've actually tested this uh, on 49 ads made by bunches of different groups, candidates, PACs, all those ads have the same small effects. Um, so I think two things, there's much less of it, but also there's no reason to worry that those ads are having some sort of undue influence on the process relative to the ads candidates make. Lynn, if I can follow up with a, a, a question to you on that topic. One, I should say for the record that I never told Lynn Vavrek that. <laughs> no, you uh, didn't. I said people, people like you who work with candidates. <laughs> clarifying for the record. But let me ask you, uh, go back to the premise of the question. Why was there less of that in 2016? And why are we now seeing a resurgence of independent money? Do you have any research that can give us any guidance on that? Uh, you know, I don't I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, maybe you do. Dan, do you have a sense of what the ebb and flow? I mean, part of it just might be who's willing to who's got money um, that they want to give or spend in this way and 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 simultaneously believe that they can affect the outcome. Um, I, I don't have a good sense of of what determines the ebb and flow. Well, I, I wouldn't have asked you if, if I did. My best guess, since you put it back, is that 2016, as it was in so many other ways, was just a completely unique election in this regard, in that Donald Trump simply didn't have that external infrastructure that had been developed months in advance to weigh in on his behalf because he was such an unexpected and unusual commodity. Yeah. And it would, would have been Clinton's external support network didn't think it was necessary because they assumed that she would win without it. But that's yeah. total guesswork, which I'm happy to pass yeah. off back if you'll let me. Yeah, there were there in 2016, there were a lot, there were some outside groups in the nominating process. Um, and you know, some candidates had really uh, tremendous amounts of support from outside groups. But maybe you're right, then when Trump gets the nomination, those groups are like, oh man didn't you know didn't see that coming and they're not really sure how they want to deploy those resources well and of course in the primary campaign uh to the large degree they they, they backfired i think in particular about yes. the way jeb bush's campaign was set up very intentionally that the campaign structure itself would be relatively small scale and they would have a very very powerfully well-funded right. extra group to support right him. to rise yeah yeah so Anyway, we should let Jessica get back into our, our questioner pool. Yeah. Um, so we got a couple of questions on the Lincoln project. So maybe both of you could kind of mm -hmm. comment on what you think its right, impact totally. uh, concerning its funding, uh, what has been its impact concerning its funding streams? And uh, yeah, what impact do you think the Lincoln project ads have had? Um, I, I'll put the, the Republican voters against Trump in that category too. So these are, the importance of these projects is the initial signal that here's going to be a group of Republicans who are going to come together to fund a campaign against the sitting Republican incumbent president. That's a very big deal. Very, very big deal. Okay. Very big deal. Okay. So then the so, second question is, you know, what effects do the ads have or the billboards? Um, and those, the effects are gonna be about the same as I described before. They're gonna be small effects in the, in the direction that they're trying to nudge people in and they're gonna go away fast. There's nothing special about, you know, the Lincoln Project ads are, are clever. Um, they are, I think, the hardest hitting ads of the campaign. Um, Dan, I'd be curious to, to, to hear if you think that's true too. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily um, gonna have bigger effects than, um, than any other ad, the candidate ads. But the importance of those projects, I think, um, are to suggest to Republican voters who may be questioning whether to vote for the candidate of their party, that there are a set of people who have worked at the highest levels um, for other presidential candidates who you've voted for, uh, who are saying we're not voting for this guy. And that's, I think, important. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll back Lynn up on that. To me, I think the most significant impact that the Lincoln Project has had is that they drive Donald Trump crazy. And, and what I will say, cool. from my, my past experience, distant as it may be, is particularly in the closing weeks of a campaign, keeping your candidate focused on what he or she should be talking about, what their message shows is most effective at motivating and persuading voters is of absolute critical importance. My impression from a great distance is that's a greater challenge with Donald Trump than it is with many candidates <laughs> to begin with. And the fact that the Lincoln Project runs such a large number of their ads in the Washington DC market makes it very clear that what they want to do is get inside of his head. Lynn makes a great point, of course, uh, is in that there's a, there's a symbolic value there. Just as we saw today, a large number of Republican federal, uh, former U.S. attorneys endorsed Biden. We saw a large number of Republican national security uh, specialists endorse him yeah, earlier in the month. So the value of that and the message it sends is a valuable one. I don't know that the average voter pays much attention to the Lincoln Project one way or the other, but if it changes the nature of Trump's messaging in the closing days of a campaign in key swing states, then that might be an impact that isn't noticed by the voters, but still impacts what they're seeing and hearing in a, in a considerable way. Thank you. Um, I'm sure both of you have, have watched this effect over the years, but how has the growth of negative partisanship affected campaigns? Negative partisanship, partisanship being the dislike of the opponent party is greater than the love of one's own party. This is, this is a topic that I, I think about a lot, along with what people call affective polarization, which is the increase of emotion in in partisan politics and i'm not sure um there's a lot of evidence that emotion has increased that people have retreated to their camps and that democrats and republicans are now like browns and steelers fans um nothing good about those people and um you know who the person because the parties are more homogenous now um we've we've the democratic south has has gone away and so people in the democratic party have the same policy positions people in the republican party now have roughly the same policy positions so there's homogeneity within the parties um and that makes it easier to identify people who are in the other party so there's that and there's a lot of evidence that um that that kind of um, cheerleading for your own side is happening and hatred of the other side. But what this question is asking about is, do people dislike their own side, but really dislike the other side even more? And um, I, I'm not sure about the balance between those things. I think what is real is this idea that it's easier to tell people apart now in terms of partisanship, largely because of the homogeneity within the parties. Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't even know about the emotion part of it. I'm, I'm a little bit agnostic on all of this, other than the fact that the parties are better sorted than they used to be. So, for those of you who've watched this election series um, over the course of the last several weeks, and for those of you who've turned into our Thursday webinar, the politics in the time of coronavirus, you've heard me recommend these books before. So, once again, I'll point you to. Uh, why We're Polarized by Ezra Klein, the progressive journalist, and Them by Ben Sass, uh, the Republican senator from Nebraska. And what both talk about is precisely this type of, of, of negative partisanship. And toward, uh, uh, toward, toward Lynn's last point, there's not evidence that people hate both parties but hate the other one more but they're certainly less enthusiastic about their own party than was the case in the past and are motivated much more toward animosity by the other. You know, we're hardwired as human beings. This goes way beyond politics to just who we are biologically and chemically. We've been hardwired since prehistoric days 
to be more acutely responsive and aware of threats rather than promises, of sticks rather than carrots. And so in some ways it might be an inevitability that politics caught up and that savvy operatives in both parties realized that the most effective way to motivate your most loyal supporters is by frightening them about what the other side might do rather than rewarding, promising them rewards uh, on, behalf of their, on behalf of their own side. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a fascinating dynamic. Those, my own opinion, Lyndon, you might have thoughts on this also, is if you look at the research of those who identify as independents, either who self-identify that way, or like many of us actually register here in California as no party preference voters, those voters uh, are not necessarily, uh, are no more centrist or no more moderate than registered Democrats or registered Republicans. What separates them from members of the two parties is a more intense and a broader animosity toward politics and politicians as a whole. An independent is just as liberal as many Democrats or just as conservative as many Republicans, but maybe it's that that animosity sprays in all directions rather than just from one side of the aisle to the other. Yeah, I, I think this is a very nuanced um, topic. And and I just want to I want to just try one more time um, to say that part of in, in order to hate the other side, there has to be the other side, and the other and 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 the, they have to be very different than us. So, um, you know, so. The, the sorting of the parties, the sorting of people of liberals into the Democratic Party and conservatives into the Republican Party. We used to have liberal Republicans and some conservative Democrats, but now ideology and party have coalesced. That sorting, I think, is one of the most important factors in driving this kind of hating the other side. And that it might not literally be because people actually feel differently about their opponents now than they did before. It's just that it's more clear who the opponents are. And so it's easier to point to them and say, those people, I don't like them, and then feel that emotion. So I think there's a lot of work to be done here on what exactly is driving the negative affect. Thank you. That doesn't necessarily vote well. I think the best place to leave it, because you're right, we don't know is which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, the us or the them? <laughs> well, what I was going to say, Good too, luck. is that, that, doesn't, that. <laughs> that doesn't bode well for bipartisan solutions if both sides have to kind of keep that fear going. And if they keep inspiring that negative partisanship, if they try to come towards the middle, they're kind of taking away their, um, their persuasive angle for their campaign. So I know someone asked last week about you know, why aren't things getting resolved when the Senate had control? Why didn't they vote against this thing? You do wonder sometimes if solutions aren't reached just because they see it as a campaign advantage. Well, I just wanna jump in on that point really quickly. There, there are a bunch of things that the American public agrees on, policy things, universal gun background checks, pathway to citizenship for dreamers. Nobody wants to defund the police. Everybody wants to ban chokeholds. Like these are things that have lopsided majorities of people. Why why don't they do them? Why don't we have legislation on on those things or policy proposals, you know, getting enacted, taking small steps in those directions? And the answer is because while people have attitudes that are lopsided, those things are not the same priorities for all people. And there's a difference between having an opinion that you want something and thinking that it's one of the most important things that government should be doing right now. And so the trick for bipartisanship and getting back to a place where we have a bunch of things happening in Congress that both sides are doing is convincing elites in Congress that those things that are lopsided are priorities for voters on the left and on the right. If Everybody decided it was very important to have universal gun background checks, more important than other things. People in Congress would take that up. 
Now, they can be leaders of that change too. As political entrepreneurs and elites, they get people to think about things. So there could be a group of people in Congress who wanna to come together to say these three things that everyone in the country wants, let's get together, form a coalition, let's tell people these are the most important things to be thinking about in the next three months and we're gonna deliver what they want. Um, but it takes a bit of entrepreneurship to, to do that. Um, and that's where I think we get a little bit stuck. It's very easy to just look at your constituents' priorities and do those things. And that's how all this stuff that people agree on across the parties gets, you know, tossed into like sort of the dustbin. And I know we have a lot more questions to get to, but I think, Lynn, I think it's a really important point. And for the benefit of our audience, I'll give you one example on that. Um, and, that's the, and that's the issue of abortion rights. Um, if you take a poll of everyone in the country, you see that by a slight margin, and emphasize slight, more people identify as pro-choice than pro-life. When you ask people if it's the most important issue on which they vote, pro-life voters tend to rank that as a high, higher priority than pro-choice voters. I, I read a professor years ago, and I've been looking for the quote again ever since to give him proper credit for the quote, but I can't find it. But I read years ago, someone smart, not me, and someone smarter, and someone smart, not Lynn, said, <laughs> "Our democracy is not a system of majority rule; it's a system of minority rule with majority acquiescence." And small numbers of people who care passionately about something generally tend to prevail over larger numbers who may disagree. But toward Lynn's point, maybe not that strongly. Very good. Thank you. Um, several people have been asking about um, local TV stations that are mostly owned by the same company, for example, St. Clair Broadcasting. Um, what impact does this have on the news Americans are watching, especially as it relates to political coverage? Yeah, uh, it's, it has a big impact on content, um, and a lot of people watch local news. Uh, I mentioned earlier that a lot of people watch the evening broadcast news. More people watch their local news. Um, and I always say that that's because it's literally news you can use, uh, the weather forecast, the traffic report, um, those kinds of things. And a lot of people watch those local news broadcasts. And again, as an accident of tuning in to see what the weather is going to be this weekend or the score of the game or whatever, um, they're getting political content as well. Now, not very much, so there's that, but um, it does affect the content and um, not, not always in a market-driven kind of way. So a lot of times what happens is if you look at differences across local news and the provision of political coverage, you'll find that the market demand is what's um, producing the kind of content that the news media are providing because it's a, it's a business. But when you take the, that sort of bottom line out of the local market and make it more broad, then you can be delivering content to people in local markets that are um, that is sort of unrelated to the market demand. Um, again, the effects will be small and, and fleeting, uh, but they, they will be there. Thank you. Um, both of you have talked about strategy toward the end of the campaign, but many voters have already voted. How has early voting changed campaign strategy? Yeah, the campaigns are keen to it. They're, they're hip to it. They know they've now start, the end of the campaign starts the day that early voting starts. Um, it changes when the get out the vote drives, you know, start. It changes when you're, you're mobilizing people by taking vans into the neighborhood or reminding people to drop their mail in. So yes, it definitely changes um, the structure of how they think of the end of the campaign. And it changes, going back to the point, Lynn, that you were making earlier in this discussion, it changes the advertising strategy. If you know that your ads are fleeting, and going back to what we were talking about earlier, if back in days of yore, you knew to build your advertising strategy back from election day, if you can only afford two weeks of advertising, you can no longer afford to wait in most states until the last week of October before going up with your ads because so many voters will have cast their ballots by then. So it forces campaigns, particularly those on more compromised budgets, state and local races more than presidential, uh, to extend their advertising strategies and start at a much earlier stage so they don't lose those, uh, those votes in the early days of mail voting. Thank you. 
Um, without interfering with free speech, how can we prevent social media, Facebook et al, from spreading misinformation, lies, and conspiracy theories? Man, if, if you know the answer to that question, um, <laughs> I have a lot of consulting jobs for you. <laughs> uh, but that, that I mean, this the, the first thing I would say is it, all of these organizations are struggling with this. Um, it, it isn't like they don't want to figure out an answer to this question. Um, they're trying, there are lots of people thinking about it. Um, I, I don't have any, any good answers to this. Um, you know, I think that I'll just add two things. The first is I keep saying persuasion is hard. Um, and it's just like, just don't ever forget that persuasion is hard. And those, that information, um, those ads on social media, they are not having any bigger effects than the ads on broadcast media. You know, for, for us to believe that ads on social media are more important to election outcomes than television ads, you have to believe that the persuasive impact of those ads, ads is like a thousand times bigger than it is for a television ad. And it's impossible, that's impossible. So whatever, you know, whatever's happening, the effects are not very big and they do go away quickly. And in the social media space, there is this big effort to correct misinformation. Now there's debate about whether correcting the misinformation actually reinforces the original misinformation or not, but um, there is counter messaging there too, which makes the effect, uh, you know, dilutes it even more. So that, that's not an answer to the question, but it might make you worry less about the question. And Jessica, I know we're almost out of time, but if I can add one point to what I think is a very smart analysis from Lynn, to a large degree, even more with social media than with traditional media platforms, the world we live in has transferred responsibility to a large degree from the news maker and the news deliverer to the news audience. And just as there were once three white anchor men in New York who decided what news should be every night, it's now up to each of us to make those decisions. The same thing exists online. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey would be thrilled to have a consultant who could tell them how to answer the question that, that, that Lynn was uh, addressing a moment ago. But I think ultimately it comes down to the consumer. And what that means is if you see something online on social media, that seems too good to be true or too bad to be true, it probably is. And just like we shouldn't rely on one single traditional legacy news source for all of our news and information, checking what we see on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram with other news sources, particularly legacy news sources, is probably not a bad cautionary check just to make sure what we're hearing is accurate because the filter to differentiate what's true and what's false hasn't been invented yet. And to Lynn's point, probably won't be anytime soon. So it's on us. Well, thank you both so much for giving us some very insightful information that is hopefully not gonna be fact-checked by Facebook or Twitter or anything like that after this. <laughs> um, so I know we had a lot of questions. So Lynn, hopefully you'll, you'll come back after the election and we can, we can get Definitely. your insight on how it was all covered. So thank you so much, Dan. Happy I'll turn to do it back it. over to you. <laughs> Okay. Um, once again, Lynn, I can't tell you how grateful we are. Um, I would, I would, I would shudder to think about what your schedule must be like seven days before a presidential election. But the fact that you're able to take an hour to spend with us and share your wisdom and your insights and your research with us is something we're very, very grateful for. And as My always, I, as always, I learned a ton from listening to you, and I know our audience, I know our audience has also. So. Uh, Likewise. Be rejoining us uh, to to wrap. Um, apparently not. So that, oh, I guess. Yeah, oh, there she is. I, I was just so enthralled in what you were both discussing. What an excellent analysis of the media impact on election. Thank you both so very much. And for our viewers, if you enjoyed this terrific discussion, please help us keep it going by texting the word election to the phone number on the screen. Every bit helps. We have a terrific lineup of programs tomorrow, a conversation with John Hope Bryant, who is the founder of Operation Hope, 
which is uh, doing great work in improving financial literacy. And of course, Thursday, we have Dan back with Politics in the Time of Coronavirus. And next week, uh, Professor Lawrence Summers, former Treasury Secretary, will be speaking on the economic recovery for the post-pandemic world. And of course, um, Dan will be here for a very special election day uh, program on November uh, 3rd. So please go to our website at lawacth.org, uh, sign up for programs, become a member, make a donation. Everybody stay safe, stay informed, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Dan, so very much. Thank you. My pleasure.